Hi guys, and this video will be first in the series of videos I am planning on human anatomy for first year medical and dental students. In these videos, I will be dealing with various topics of human anatomy, covering only the relevant points for various university exams for medical and dental students, with the help of simple diagrams drawn digitally by me, which with a little bit of practice even the students can reproduce. Parallel to these exam oriented class videos, I will also be uploading videos of 3D models of structures dealt in these topics created by me in an open source software like uh, Blender, which will help the students in understanding the features and interrelationship of the structures in a more holistic manner, which is more relevant clinically. In this first video, we will be dealing with thyroid gland, which is an important, a long answer topic for most university exams. Thyroid, which means sheet like, is an endocrine gland situated in neck. It deals with basal metabolic rate. First, we will see the situation and extent of the thyroid gland, its parts and features. For that, we will need a couple of diagrams, which we will do now. Okay, so our thyroid gland has two lobes connected by an isthmus. The lobes extend from about the middle of thyroid cartilage to fourth or fifth tracheal ring, whereas the isthmus extends between second to fourth tracheal ring. We have to set that stage first. Okay, let's start drawing. Here, this is the hyoid bone followed by the thyroid cartilage next comes the cricoid cartilage then the trachea with tracheal rings so the stage is set okay as we saw already while drawing the diagrams the thyroid gland as such extends from c5 to t1 each lobe of the thyroid gland extends from about middle of thyroid cartilage to fourth or fifth tracheal ring. Isthmus extends from second to fourth tracheal ring. Okay, now we will add our thyroid gland to this stage. The thyroid consists of two conical lobes connected by an isthmus. There can be a pyramidal lobe which extends from the isthmus or one of the lobes the thyroid gland has two capsules one the true capsule which is the condensation of connective tissue of the gland itself and the other one outside that is the false capsule which is derived from the pretracheal layer of deep cervical fascia apart from this there can be a fibrous or fibromuscular band extending from the pyramidal lobe to the hyoid bone. Deep to the true capsule, there is a dense capillary plexus. Now the parts of the thyroid gland. Thyroid gland consists of two lobes, right and left, connected by a isthmus. Sometimes there can be a pyramidal lobe which projects upwards from isthmus or one of the lobes. There is a fibrous or fibromuscular band which extends from hyoid bone to either the pyramidal lobe or the isthmus and it is called levator glandulae thyroidae. Now coming to the features. Each lobe of the thyroid gland is conical in shape with an apex directed upwards and laterally and a base. Each lobe has three surfaces, lateral, medial, posterolateral and two borders, anterior and posterior. In order to show that, we will need another diagram which we will do now. This is the cross sectional or transverse sectional view at the level of thyroid gland. Here we will draw the thyroid gland sectional view showing its 
three surfaces that is lateral, medial and posterolateral. As we saw while drawing the diagram in a cross section it is evident that each lobe of thyroid gland has three surfaces lateral, medial and posterolateral and two borders anterior and posterior. Anterior border separating lateral and posterolateral surface, posterior border separating medial and posterolateral surface. Isthmus of the thyroid gland as you can see in this diagram has two surfaces anterior and posterior and as you can see here it has two borders superior and inferior. Now coming to the coverings of the thyroid gland, the thyroid gland is covered by two capsules, true capsule and false capsule. The true capsule is the peripheral condensation of the connective tissue of the gland itself and the false capsule is derived from the pretracheal layer of deep cervical fascia. The deep cervical fascia and its layers will be dealing in some other class. And the false capsule which is derived from the pretracheal layer of deep cervical fascia is thickened posteriorly and this thickened portion is called suspensory ligament of Berry and it is attached to the cricoid cartilage. This is the one structure which holds the thyroid gland in position. We have seen the situation, parts and features of the thyroid gland. Now we will move on to the next topic that is the blood supply of thyroid gland. First we will see the arterial supply. For that we will have to add the arteries to the existing diagram. We will do that now. Thyroid gland is supplied by two arteries superior thyroid artery and inferior thyroid artery. Before drawing those arteries as such, we will have to set the stage for those arteries. We will do that now. This is our arch of aorta with its three branches. That is the brachiocephalic, left common carotid and left subclavian. The brachiocephalic further divides into right subclavian and right common carotid. The common carotid moves up, divides into external and internal carotid. The same thing happens on the left side. The left common carotid courses upwards, divides into external and internal carotid. The subclavian gives out the thyro cervical trunk same thing on the other side okay now we will add a nerve which is a relation to these arteries that is the vagus nerve vagus nerve accompanies the common carotid artery we will add that on the other side also So now the stage is set and we are in a position to add the arteries supplying the thyroid gland as such. The thyroid gland is supplied by superior thyroid artery which is a branch of external carotid artery. On reaching the upper pole of the gland it divides into an anterior branch and posterior branch. The anterior branch runs along the anterior border of the thyroid gland then along the upper border of the isthmus we will add the same on the other side the superior thyroid artery dividing into anterior and posterior branch the anterior branch of both sides anastomos at the upper border of isthmus. Now we will add the relation of superior thyroid artery that is the external laryngeal nerve which is a branch of superior laryngeal which is again a branch of vagus nerve.
the external laryngeal nerve follows the superior thyroid artery very close most of its course except where it reaches the pole of the gland it diverges away we will do the same thing on the other side the external laryngeal nerve following the superior thyroid artery. The other major artery supplying the thyroid gland is inferior thyroid artery which is a branch of thyro cervical tree. It moves up to the base of the gland and divides into glandular branches supplying the thyroid gland. Before that it gives out an ascending branch which runs along the posterior border of the gland which we will see shortly. We will add the same thing on the other side. This inferior thyroid artery is closely followed by a recurrent laryngeal nerve which is a branch of vagus nerve. But here in this case the nerve is away from the artery for most of its course except near the base of the gland where it comes close to the artery. So our diagram is done. Let's move back to our slides. Okay. As we saw while drawing the diagrams, the thyroid gland is mainly supplied by two arteries, the superior thyroid artery and the inferior thyroid artery. The superior thyroid artery is a branch of external carotid artery courses towards the apex of thyroid gland and at the upper pole of the lobe of the thyroid gland it divides into anterior and posterior branch. The anterior branch further continues along the anterior border of the lobe then the upper border of the isthmus and anastomosis with the fellow of the opposite side. In order to better view the course of the posterior branch, we will need another diagram which is the lateral view of the thyroid gland. We will do that now. This is the lateral view of thyroid gland, the subclavian artery giving out its thyro cervical trunk. The superior thyroid artery reaching the upper pole of the gland dividing into anterior and posterior branch the anterior branch running along the anterior border the artery followed by external laryngeal nerve the posterior bran uh, uh, branch running along the posterior border the inferior thyroid artery giving glandular branches and ascending branch which runs along the posterior border of thyroid gland anastomosis with the posterior branch of superior thyroid artery Okay, as we already saw while drawing the diagram and as you can see here the posterior branch of the superior thyroid artery runs along the posterior border of the lobe and it anastomoses with the ascending branch of inferior thyroid artery which we will see shortly. You will also see that all along its course up to the upper pole of the thyroid gland this superior thyroid artery is closely related to external laryngeal nerve but as they reach the pole they diverge this is surgically relevant and we will come to that relevance later okay the other major artery supplying the thyroid gland is inferior thyroid artery inferior thyroid artery is a branch of thyro cervical trunk of subclavian artery this artery as we saw is related to recurrent laryngeal nerve it reaches the lower pole of the gland where it divides into four or five glandular branches supplying the gland before that it gives out an ascending branch which runs along the posterior border and anastomosis with the posterior branch of superior thyroid artery which we already saw apart from these two arteries 
there may be another artery about in 3% of individuals which is called thyroidea ema artery. We will add that to the picture now. Okay, as you can see, this thyroid ema artery, which is present only in about 3% of individuals, is either a branch of brachiocephalic trunk or it can arise directly from arch of iota and it enters the lower part of isthmus. Now we move on to the blood supply that is venous drainage. Blood supply includes both arterial supply and venous drainage. In order to deal with the venous drainage, we will need another diagram. We will do that now. This is again the lateral view of thyroid gland, the internal jugular vein joining with subclavian vein to form the brachiocephalic vein. The thyroid gland is drained by three or four veins. The superior thyroid vein drains into the internal jugular vein. The middle thyroid vein again drains into the internal jugular vein the inferior thyroid which drains into brachiocephalic and there can be a fourth vein called vein of kosher which drains into the internal jugular okay as you saw in the diagram Thyroid gland is mainly drained by three veins, superior, middle and inferior thyroid vein. The superior thyroid vein emerges from the upper pole of the thyroid gland. It accompanies the superior thyroid artery and it drains into internal jugular vein as you can see here. The middle thyroid vein emerges from the middle of the lobe and it also drains into internal jugular vein. The inferior thyroid vein emerges from the lower border of isthmus and it drains into the left brachiocephalic vein. Apart from these three, there can be a fourth thyroid vein called the vein of kosher and if present, it emerges between the middle and inferior thyroid vein and drains into internal jugular vein. Coming to the lymphatics. We will add the lymphatics to the diagram. The thyroid gland is drained by two group of lymph nodes mainly, the upper deep cervical and the lower deep cervical. As you saw, the thyroid gland is drained by mainly two group of nodes. The upper part is drained by upper deep cervical nodes and the lower part by lower deep cervical nodes. The nerve supply of thyroid gland is mainly sympathetic vasoconstrictor derived mainly from middle cervical and partly from superior cervical and inferior cervical ganglia. Now we are in a position to see the relations of the thyroid gland. We will bring back our old diagram. As we already saw, the apex of each loop is related to the superior thyroid artery and external laryngeal nerve. Whereas the base is related to inferior thyroid artery and a recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now we will add the relations of each surface to the old diagram we already made. The medial surface is related to two tubes, the trachea and esophagus. The lateral surface is related to muscles, sternohyoid, homohyoid sternothyroid, sternocleidomastoid and the posterolateral surface is related to carotid sheath and its contents. As we saw while doing the diagram, the lateral surface of each lobe is convex and it is related to the muscles sternohyoid, superior belly of homohyoid sternothyroid and sternocleidomastoid. Coming to the medial surface, we see that it is related to two tubes, the trachea and esophagus. 
and two muscles related to these two tubes that is trachea and esophagus. The muscles are number one cricothyroid which is a muscle of larynx which is related to trachea and the inferior constrictor which is a muscle of pharynx which is related to esophagus. So two tubes trachea esophagus two muscles cricothyroid and inferior constrictor and two nerves which we already saw there is the external laryngeal and recurrent laryngeal. The posterolateral surface is related to carotid sheath and the contents with it. That is the internal carotid artery, internal jugular vein and vagus nerve. The anterior border as we already saw while dealing with blood supply is related to the anterior branch of superior thyroid artery. The posterior border is related to the inferior thyroid artery, the ascending branch of inferior thyroid artery, the posterior branch of superior thyroid artery, the anastomosis between these two that is the ascending branch of inferior thyroid artery and the posterior branch of superior thyroid artery. Along with this it is also related to the parathyroid glands and thoracic duct. The thoracic duct is present only on the left side not on the right lobe. Okay now coming to the relations of isthmus. The anterior surface of the isthmus is related to both a right and left sternohyoid muscle, anterior jugular vein, skin and fascia. Whereas the posterior surface of isthmus is related to second to fourth tracheal ring which you might remember we saw already here is dealing with the extent of thyroid gland. The upper border of isthmus is related to the anterior branch of a right and left superior thyroid artery and their anastomosis. The lower border of isthmus is related to the inferior thyroid veins. As you can see, if you are thorough with the blood supply, that is the major artery supplying the gland, its course relations, it is easier to enumerate the relations of thyroid gland also. Now moving on to the last segment, that is the clinical anatomy. The swelling of thyroid gland as you know is called goiter and any thyroid swelling is always palpated from behind and you should also know any thyroid swelling moves with deglutition. Why? Because as we already saw the thyroid gland is covered by a false capsule which is derived from pretracheal fascia and the posterior part of this is thickened to form suspensory ligament of peri which is attached to the cricoid cartilage which is part of the larynx. So whenever the larynx moves, the thyroid gland also moves along with it. The removal, the surgical removal of thyroid gland is called thyroidectomy. And there are a few surgical anatomy points which are relevant to the surgery of thyroidectomy. One is the presence of the capillary plexus deep to the true capsule of thyroid which we already saw. Due to the presence of these capillary plexus, the thyroid gland is removed along with the true capsule in order to avoid bleeding. This you can contrast with the surgical removal of prostate gland where both the capsules are left behind because the plexus, the capillary plexus in case of prostate gland lies between the two capsules. The other surgical anatomy point relevant to the surgery of thyroidectomy is concerned with the relations of superior and inferior thyroid artery. During the surgery of thyroidectomy, both superior and inferior thyroid artery should be ligated. During the process of ligation, all care must be taken not to injure the external laryngeal nerve and a recurrent laryngeal nerve which closely accompany the superior thyroid artery and inferior thyroid artery. As we saw in the relations, the external laryngeal nerve 
closely accompanies the superior thyroid artery for most part except where it comes close to the upper pole of the gland where this nerve diverges away. So superior thyroid artery is ligated as close to the gland as possible in order to prevent injury to the external laryngeal nerve. In contrast we can see that the recurrent laryngeal nerve is away from the artery for most of its course but it comes close to the artery only as the artery nears the gland. So in order to save the recurrent laryngeal nerve the inferior thyroid artery is ligated as away from the gland as possible. With that note the class on thyroid gland ends. The PDF notes of the slides discussed here are available for free download in the link provided in the description. If you like my class hit the like button for more such class videos keep the channel subscribed. Video discussing the same topic with the help of a 3D model will be uploaded shortly. More videos on more topics in human anatomy will be coming in due course. If anyone interested in live one-to-one -one exam oriented guidance through online classes via tools like Zoom or Webex, please do drop a mail in the mail ID provided in the description. Thanks for watching the video. Bye.